Welcome to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Sanj Kakar. As COVID-19 continues to spread, the World Health Organization says more than 117 million children in 37 countries may be missing out on receiving life-saving measles vaccine. The World Health Organization has issued some guidelines to help countries sustain immunization activities during the COVID-19 pandemic. Here to discuss this is Mayo Clinic primary care physician, Dr. Tina Arden. Dr. Arden, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. So, you know, it seems an obvious question, but I think it's important to, to answer. Why is children immunization and vaccine so important? Well, I think the current situation with the novel coronavirus just shows us how scary a world can be when we have a disease that we can't treat or prevent. Um, so when we talk about childhood vaccines, the whole concept is that we have vaccines that can prevent serious illnesses that can be harmful and even fatal for our children. And so we don't want to lose that opportunity to stay on top of those things that we have control over right now. So there's uh, some parents, they have some concerns about vaccines uh, for various reasons. What is your message to them? I, you know, I have three kids. I'm a mom of three. My oldest is six. I have a four-year-old and I have a, um, a younger son who's 15 months. So I've gone through the vaccine process myself with my own children. I personally followed the same guidelines with the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics um, for my own family. And I certainly understand right now being very thoughtful about taking your children outside the home for doctor's visits and for vaccines. I would encourage families who have concerns about what that feels like for them based on maybe where they live, if that's a hot spot with the current um, COVID-19 versus um, how old their children are, what vaccines are due for, to have some conversations with their clinics and their pediatricians and family doctors about what the priorities are at this point in time. I mean, there may be some situations where we can wait a little bit to, to have that well child visit and have that vaccine. Or maybe for that child, getting that immunization is extremely important. And we don't want to lose time to do that and do it in a safe practice. So many of our clinics and hospitals have been weighing the risk and benefits of seeing our children in the outpatient setting and making sure we have some good processes in place to make that as safe as possible, knowing how important these vaccines are. Because as you said, we, we don't want to bring people into the hospital unnecessarily because of fears of exposure. And so, as you said, I think it is important to contact your healthcare provider to discuss when and if they should have it and how it should be delivered. So what are the, some, what are the most important vaccines for children? Well, right now, one of the vaccines that's really on our radar are, is the measles vaccine. So we know that there have been more outbreaks of measles even here in the United States. And that is a, um, a potentially deadly illness that we want to prevent. So that's a vaccine, of course, we've had a lot of attention on for some time, but we don't want to get off track with the timing of that vaccine. I also think about pertussis. You know, that's another one that can be extremely harmful for our babies and our younger children. Um, and so making sure that we're staying on top of that schedule for pertussis as well. You, my saying will always be all vaccines are important, but I definitely think about those two in particular right now. And what about when one enters the winter season, the flu vaccine? What are your thoughts about the flu vaccine for children? Yes, um, I've done lots of videos and talks about the flu vaccine um, for many reasons. One, as a mom with young children, and also um, having been pregnant through three different flu seasons as well, thinking about mom and baby. And so um, the flu vaccine, I've always said, is extremely important for anyone to get who's old enough to get it. Um, I think this season, it'll be even that much more important to do as well. Obviously, we know how important vaccination has been. It's, it's uh, essentially eradicated some diseases back in the past, which were life-threatening. In terms of delaying childhood vaccines, uh, are we concerned about these diseases possibly coming up again? So I think that is a concern, yes. And that's why it's been in our conversations right now with our parents and families in terms of what visits we prioritize. Um, we don't want to get too far behind with those vaccines. You know, I explained to parents and families that the reason they're recommended at the time they're recommended is that that is the time that we get the most protection from them. You know, there is a time when maybe you're not going to do a polio vaccine anymore because that child is too old. Um, or maybe there's another concern that we can't administer that vaccine at that time. Um, so we want to really make sure we're following that schedule because that schedule is there for a reason. Tina, anything else we need to discuss? No, again, I really want parents and families to um, encourage them to reach out. You know, I think there's a lot of fear and misinformation out there about what we're providing in terms of care for our patients. And so I'm happy to talk to our own families here to let them know what services we're providing, uh, you know, address their concerns, make sure they feel comfortable with that, again, knowing how important these vaccines are for our children. During this COVID-19 pandemic, we hear a lot about social distancing and face masks. 
And when you watch the news, a lot of it has been about adults. How have you seen this uh, affect uh, children? Uh, for example, obviously the face masks that most of us use are adult face masks. What are your thoughts about using those on children? We know that the, the direction around face masks has changed really you know, quickly over the last several weeks. And so now the guidance is to recommend face masks for all people um, and including children older than the age of two. So two years old and older. Um, and so we are looking at ways to make sure that that's practical and, and easy for, for families to do and safe for families to do now. And so as a mother of three yourself, when you're taking your children out for a walk, what, what do you do? So if I know that we're going to be able to walk safely and not be around other groups of people in the neighborhood, I do not think a mask is necessary in those situations. And that's been outlined in the guidelines. However, if you're not sure that you can safely social distance when you're out with your family, then that's when you really want to think about that face mask for your child. You know, you, I think about the single mom or the single parent who has to go to the grocery store and has to take their seven-year-old with them because they don't have anyone to watch that child. We want to make sure that child has a mask on in that situation. Um, if there are other opportunities, however, to still practice those social distancing measures uh, where maybe one parent or one adult in the family can go to the grocery store and leave the children at home, that might be the safer option in general. So with the children cooped up at home and, and the weather changing, now they want to go out and they may see their friends. What are your thoughts about children playing with their friends? I think right now, just in, in terms of adhering to those social distancing guidelines, I, I would say now is not a good time to play with your friends on those play dates. So yeah, I think unfortunately with the recommendations regarding facial masks is that some families may feel like that means that they can do some of these things as long as they're wearing a mask. The mask is really just another layer of protection for our communities if you have to be out in public, at the grocery store, at the doctor's office, those sorts of, of experiences. But it doesn't mean that we start doing lots of things with our friends and our family in the neighborhoods because we can wear face masks in those situations. So as you know, obviously, children are not little adults. And when we try and speak to them and, and explain that to them, they don't really understand. And there's a lot of messaging going on about COVID-19 on the news, on the radio, and the seriousness of it. How should we be talking to our children such that they understand the magnitude of this, but not overly worrying them about it? As a mother, I, I feel that it's my job to give my children the best information possible and give it to them in a safe environment. So our kids look to us as parents, as grandparents, as adult family members to provide them reliable information in a safe setting. And I think it will depend on the age of your child and the child's personality. My oldest is six, so she's not that much older than some of the other teenagers that we're kind of seeing in our clinic here, but she has some understanding about not being at school, right? Not being in kindergarten. Um, Prior to school um, being transitioned to virtual learning, she was doing a lot more hand washing. So she had an idea that there was something out there that we needed to wash our hands more for and be careful about. And so using facts in that situation may be helpful for that child. Whereas my four-year-old doesn't really quite understand anything about what's going on, except that we're making her wash her hands a lot. And so we just kind of, you know, again, tailor that conversation based on the child and their age. For our older children and our teenagers, for sure, because they have such you know, easy access to the news and to social media and to their phones and their tablets. Um, I think it's about, again, having those honest conversations as parents and families, and then perhaps being a little bit more thoughtful about how much they are getting from those sources in terms of the news and the media, because they may may actually lead to more anxiety or fear than be helpful. So you, you talked about anxiety and also virtual learning. I think the anxiety is more on the parents uh, when you come to virtual learning. What is your message to parents as well when their children now at home? And you know, you want to make sure that your child is getting what they need and not doing too much but or doing too little. So how are you trying to balance that in your household? My saying for the last probably six weeks has been a little grace and a lot of patience. So, you know, we want to still be good parents. We want to still take care of our kids and help them flourish in the new environment that we're kind of forced in now. But I think giving ourselves some leeway to make some mistakes and kind of work on that together. Our kids need to see that from us as well as adults that we struggle a little bit too, that we're learning a new process. And, and that makes it, I think, easier for them too, to talk about their feelings. So again, a little grace, a little patience, do what you can, reach out for help when you need it. I'm, even my daughter's kindergarten teacher has been very easy to access. I can email her if I'm having trouble with an assignment. Um, and that's been helpful for me to feel less stressed about that. And that, that's great advice, I think, uh, as we go through this stressful time. What, what about the older children? Obviously, those that are in school where it's now these are important years for them and important months for their education as they're going through high school what what is your message to them 
I really encourage families to just be honest about their conversations and, and check in with those children. We know that sometimes teenagers aren't quite as forthright with wanting to talk to their parents about how they're feeling, but at least opening up the door to check in and see if they want to have a conversation, if they just want to spend some time together. Um, we all deal with anxiety and fears in different ways, um, and not every child is going to want to talk about all those things, um, you know, with, in an hour-long conversation with their mom, but there may be some times where they just want to sit with you, or they maybe want to spend some time with you outside and that's their way of coping with that stress too so I think it's about leaving that door open to have those conversations if they're ready to have them and obviously as you said now the children at home they have a lot of pent-up energy and uh, they need to get it out uh, out of their system what are your thoughts about uh, daily activities for the children Yes, our family has made it a priority to get out of the house at least once, if not twice, every day. Um, I think that's important not just for our kids, but for our grown-ups, our adults, to get some time outside the home. Even in clinic, we're spending more time in our offices and, and you know, teleworking. We're not getting a lot of fresh air. And I think with the stress of everything that's been happening, getting outside and spending some time together as a family with physical activity has so many benefits besides um, exercise and physical activity. There, are, every cloud has a silver lining. So I, I'm privileged to have been spending more time with our children than we've ever done. Uh, yes. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. Only time will tell. But yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. We've been discussing children, masking and routine vaccines with Mayo Clinic primary care physician, Dr. Tina Arden. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.